Morning Revolution, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution. Hello, everybody. Hope you hope you had a good week. Anita, Michael, and and uh, Scott. Uh, uh, how are you? Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning. Good morning, Say Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. Morning, you Revolution. Say revolution, Michael. There you we're go. We're not going to believe you're really a communist. <laughs> <laughs> right, right on. That, that's what. So, <laughs> good morning, gotta, good morning, Revo. <laughs> good morning, Revo. That's another variation of it. We'll accept that. So, uh, big week, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Biden. Uh, the, Scott's uh, homeboy and president <laughs> of these United States uh, withdrew the troops or promised to withdraw the troops from Afghanistan. Uh, what's the date, Michael? September the 11th? Yeah, well, starting on May 1st and ending uh, by September 11th. Starting on May Day, on May Day, <laughs> Workers' Day. Um, well, that's significant. I'm sure that uh, Fox News will See that, Anita, as extremely significant. Oh, they'll read something into it, no doubt. I, I have no idea, but it's a really one makes you wonder why we haven't done it up until now. So, well, so they were trying. You know, I went to school with a guy from Pakistan way back then, and he said, "Joey, they will never win. The, he said, the Russia, Soviets can't win it." And he said, "The uh, United States is not going to win it. It's a uh, just." the sheer terrain of the country mitigate Scott any military solution to that crisis, mm -hmm. you know? What do you think? Well, um, I think, you know, I certainly welcome the withdrawal of troops. Uh, I wish they were being withdrawn further um, because it sounds uh, from some of what I've read, like uh, they're gonna be redeployed uh, to other spots in Central Asia, in Central Asia in Tajikistan and, and uh, Kazakhstan, I believe, um, and that the, the campaign of, of drone surveillance and the special forces presence uh, in Afghanistan um, will, will continue. Uh, so this is a step forward, but you know, in terms of ending the war in Afghanistan, you know, I think we have to be clear about what ending the war would look like, which is the withdrawal of, of the U.S. military from the entire region. Um, on the other hand, it's there's a there's a, a quagmire in Afghanistan that is directly the product of, you know, um, half a century almost of forty years, I guess, of U.S. Uh, meddling and, and interference. So, I'm for withdrawing the troops, but Anita, do you have to withdraw? all of the troops from the region in, in order to end the war in Afghanistan? Is that real? I mean, is that, are those two things contingent you're upon talking, each other? You're not talking to a military uh, expert <laughs> here, <laughs> Joe. I just think when I think about the trillions of dollars that have been wasted on this war and this, you know, war machine that continues to be um, in power in, in, in our con contemporary military budget, for example, what a terrible waste of um, of resources uh, for us. I mean, we could put that those funds to so much better use in in for solving real people's problems and uh, you know bringing over people from all over the world for education reasons or just cultural exchange. I mean, really. Um, but to help working people would be how you could spend that money much more productively. Michael, were you surprised when you when you picked up your uh, phone because you don't read the newspaper? Or you're not one of those print people. Uh, you picked up your phone in the morning when you were having your coffee on the train, and you saw the news that that the, there was an announcement of a troop withdrawal. Or did you expect it? Um. I don't think I was surprised just because I had heard Obama kind of make hints at that too. And Biden says we have to go back to normal. So I was expecting uh, some of that. But um, regarding your last question, because I hadn't considered that, I, I do think it has to be a withdrawal from more than just Afghanistan, because these are the physical troops that you see being withdrawn. But that doesn't mean that the CIA operations and the bombings, which take place in places, you know, like uh, Syria, Yemen, that doesn't mean that those will continue. You know, it, those could very well uh, continue, which means the war would continue. Um, and so we'll see, you know, we have to, 
our position needs to be um, the firm, you know, all op military operations need to cease, all imperialism and military bases need to, uh, to cease operations. But wait a minute now, when the, when, the, when the helicopters left Vietnam, that didn't mean that the uh, US military carriers uh, left the region. And it didn't mean that the nuclear arsenal, the part of it still wasn't pointed at. I mean, so, I mean, there are, there are various degrees of, but, you know, if the troops are gone and, and if there's a political process in place, uh, but the country belongs to the people of Afghanistan, for God's sake. And, you know, whatever happens, they have to determine their own destiny, even if we don't like it. You know, I mean, you can't impose, you can't export bourgeois democracy, Michael. You can't export it. You know, I mean, you, you got it, nation building uh, and all that kind of thing is, is craziness. And, and, and but I want to ask Scott another question. Do you think that this signals the end of the forever war? No, I this think the beginning of the end. I, I don't think so. I mean, hope, hopefully this is the, a, a product of the uh, movement that will eventually abolish or end the forever war and, you know, demilitarize, uh, largely demilitarize the United States and shift our foreign policy. You know, those huge goals of internationalism that, um, that all communist parties uh, hold. Um, but I think the forever war very much continues. Um, and you know, some people um, on the left have started talking about hybrid war, uh, which is this combination of um, you know, infiltration, intelligence operations, economic sanctions, military actions, all of, uh, all of them working uh, jointly to um, perpetuate US hegemony. Um, so in, in the case of Vietnam that you mentioned, um, the war I would say is, you know, is not fully over until the, the troops are gone, the missiles are no longer pointed and, and diplomacy uh, is open. Um, diplomacy on a, a footing of equality is the basis for relations. But the Vietnamese and the United States have had friendly diplomatic relations for, I don't know, two or three decades now. And, and I mean, there's not a, an actual war taking place there, I mean, is 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 uh, Anita? Is Biden now the going to get the Nobel Peace Prize? Is he your president of peace, or is this something something nefarious going on beneath uh, this? I think the Nobel Peace Prize committee uh, learned its lesson when it gave a premature uh, award to uh, President Obama. Um, so I, I think they are going to be wary of uh, any such a, a, a award, but I, I don't think uh, Biden has has earned it yet either. Um, and um, you know we have a long way to go. I mean, as Scott said, it's not the end of the the conflict there. It's not the end. Uh, also, besides those other kinds of war that are in hybrid war, there's cyber war, and I'm sure that's going to get. Uh, heated up in the next, um, and who knows, bio, bio weapons too. So I, I think, you know, things are not, until we, we solve that problem of um, imperialism um, and, uh, and get that under control, we're still going to have that conflict. And another, yeah. another portion of this is that um, it seems like, you know, the, um, the U.S. military and um, also um, I believe the French uh, military are starting to reorient their strategies uh, um, away from the counterinsurgency kind of stuff that has dominated over, you know, the past twenty years or so, and and toward um, renewal of um, like great power conflict, um, you know, large scale, I guess you might call it traditional war but with these cyber elements and, and so forth. So part of this is, um, I would imagine has to be considered in that context as well. Um, you know, the, the Middle East is no longer the, uh, you know, strategic spot for the United States. Um, and uh, I think the saber rattling on China is, is reaching a new level. Michael, is there a new orientation for US 
policy, foreign policy is is the progressive domestic uh, pro-people orientation, supposedly of the new administration being reflected in the foreign policy apparatus. I mean, you got them going back to the Paris Climate Accord, and you talk, you got them talking about greater cooperation on healthcare and, and you know catastrophes and COVID and and on the so um, is there something new here? My mind goes back to the 1960s. No, I don't think it's new. When LBJ, they were buttons, uh, buttons uh, that the Republicans were handing out that says, you know, vote against socialism, vote against LBJ. You know, universal health care is, is socialism. And LBJ, while advocating for progressive, you know, anti-racist, uh, you know, Civil Rights Act and those kind of policies at home, he was, you know, getting more and more involved in the war in Vietnam. And so I do think, you know, we say that you we're not for, you know, progressive policy at home and imperialist policy abroad, but obviously, you know, the, the uh, corporate parties that run this country are, you know, unfortunately. And I mean, it happens everywhere. I'm thinking of Spain, where I used to live, where the current, you know, progressive uh, party and the Socialist Workers Party, it's a social democratic group, they're members of NATO. They're very supportive of NATO and the EU, the European Union. Uh, but domestically, you know, they're for the welfare state, nationalizing hospitals, and so forth. And so I think we have to call out these fallacies, these contradictions, wherever possible. And we have to point out the contradictions. Wait, 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 wait. Scott, when has a U.S. president and his administration ever called for putting working class people before foreign, uh, uh, before corporate profits when it comes to foreign policy? When? Um, I, I'm not sure that they have. Although Trump certainly made a lot of uh, promises and noise in that direction, you know, uh, showing up at um, manufacturing sites and uh, talking about, you know, the need to bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States and get tough on China and, uh, and this and that. Um, looking at the, the interim national security guidance uh, that, that the White House published, um, yeah, there, there are some there are some, there is in some sense a new orientation, a recognition that um, you can't have a strong United States uh, without, you know, getting rid of or addressing the economic inequality, the um, massive uh, cost of education problems, lack of healthcare, all that stuff. Um, at the same time, you know, we know that you can't help the working class domestically by targeting uh, other countries. Um, imperialism is never gonna be in the service of the working class, right? Um, so this is, a, it's a contradictory policy. It's a contradiction that arises because, you know, we have this strong movement pushing toward democracy and we have the ruling class, you know, pushing back uh, you know, for, for its own interests. And um, I, I think there's this thought that there can be like an equilibrium somehow between those things, but there's, there's not. Like we have to keep pushing forward for a, an all around working class policy, which includes, you know, um, internationalism, respect for the sovereignty of other nations, defunding or, you know, redirecting funds from the military and, and stuff like that. Yeah, let's defund the military, but Anita, what are they trying to do here? Is this, a, is this, are they, are they like, is this evidence of the labor aristocracy approach that they're trying to buy off the American working people with all of these programs to solve the COVID crisis and provide jobs and extend unemployment and, and uh, empower healthcare workers, raise the minimum wage maybe even, and, and yet they're going to try to uh, impose U.S. old school military imperialist rule around the world. Is that, is that your analysis? It's not my analysis, but it's an analysis <laughs> that is made often. Uh, and and we, we've been talking about that uh, recently in, in our district. Um, the idea that, that this is a, some kind of labor aristocracy, that the people in the U.S., the working class in the U.S. have some advantage. 
But we, while that argument can be made and certain facts can be marshaled in its, uh, in its defense, it, it isn't the right argument to make. It's, um, it's, it, uh, it fails, it paralyzes us, you know, for how, how to act in the future. So, uh, so no, I don't think the, that's the correct analysis at all. I don't think a labor aristocracy is, labor aristocracy are just two words that are oxymoronic and don't go together. So um, I, I think we have to look towards the unity of the working class and the unity of the working class in, in this country. Uh, that's what we're working on in our party. Um, and we're in solidarity with workers around the world, working for uh, socialism and uh, unity of the working class in their own uh, countries. So Michael, where is, the, where is the, May Day's coming up, May 1st. Where is uh, International Workers' Day? Anita said unity of the working class in this country and the unity of the working class internationally. Where is the peace movement? Where is the internationalism? Where is the big protest against they bombed uh, Syria the other week? Uh, what are y'all going to do about that? Well, I think that's the essential role of uh, the Communist Party and the growing socialist moment right now here in the United States. You know, this is, I think, maybe the only country in the world which doesn't celebrate um, International Workers Day on May 1st. You know, our Labor Day is the first uh, Monday in September. And so there's a lack of uh, perhaps that unity or consciousness here in the United States. And it's our responsibility um, to, I don't wanna say teach because it's not teaching down, but participate in these wider democratic struggles, whether it be against war, um, for the PRO Act, you know, supporting the PRO Act and, um, you know, building this unity around these issues, you know, that's really up to us to, to be a, a guiding uh, voice while participating and at sometimes, you know, leading and taking initiative in these wider movements. Scott, don't you think it's dangerous to compare Trump to Biden? Are you, are you arguing that there's, okay, that there's a right wing populism from Trump, fascist tends, maybe a little bit more than tinge, and then there's a left-wing populism from Biden. Is that what you're trying to argue? No, I'm arguing that the foreign policy of the U.S. ruling class is remarkably consistent uh, across administrations. Um, you know, we see some variation in terms of, you know, under the Obama administration, a, a much greater predilection for kind of um, drones and a minimal sort of human footprint on the ground, much more, you know, covert work and, and remote work uh, versus uh, Trump, who, who was much more, in some sense, uh, belligerent about uh, the U.S. military. Um, but the, the goal um, and the, the enemies that are, tar or the so-called enemies who are targeted remain very consistent. And right now, um, the, this campaign against China, the you know accusations, the uh, mischaracterizations, the constant portraying of, of China as you know a great threat to the American people and to the American working class and and China's growth as destabilizing to the world, um, that has been going on uninterruptedly since at least I would say 2012 or so. Mm. That it really. But Joe? Anita, they say that there's nothing new under the sun. And yet there's some new things here with respect to climate change, mm -hmm. with respect to health care. <clears throat> and um, so those are opportunities for the environmental movement and the peace movement and <clears throat> to flex its muscles, to grab hold of it, push, push open those doors. And, 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 and perhaps there are other doors that can be pushed open. They say that they're gonna improve relations with Cuba. We'll see. Uh, mm -hmm. I, know I don't see what's stopping us, them from doing it. <laughs> no, nothing stopping them. Some of them. us are, are gonna try to go down there to watch the vaccine uh, program. Mm -hmm. Isn't mm -hmm. the responsibility of, of Anita, of the communists to push those doors open because well, they might open other doors. 
we we need to open those doors and and open them uh, with Cuba definitely and um and I think I mean as far as comparing Biden with Trump, I feel in the first uh, hundred days of Trump's administration, I was much more afraid of all out nuclear war than I am right now. So maybe that's a difference, but um, but I and I do think we we've, we've made some gains, but we just have to keep pushing. And I think like Michael's going to say, pushing that those border wall uh, wall gates open a little bit. I think he might I, be saying. I would, I would yeah. <laughs> she read my mind, but I was thinking more along the lines of I think it's almost uh, lazy and inaccurate to to compare Trump's anti Chinese and anti. Uh, cl science, anti-climate change rhetoric without of Trump's, and I, or I'm sorry, without of Biden's. And I think, you know, we can applaud, you know, Biden's support for the PRO Act. I think that's fine. And, you know, he even, he expressed solidarity with the uh, Alabama, you know, Amazon workers. But I think, you know, the fact that Biden's foreign policy is, uh, you know, just as aggressive, if not more, in some, in some ways. And the fact that he even seized a family's uh, property along the Texas-Mexico border, he has seized uh, on Tuesday to continue the construction. You know, these are things that need to be called out because during his election campaign, it was a totally different rhetoric coming from him. So mm -hmm. call out what needs to be called out, you know, the fallacies and the, and the contradictions, but applaud, you know, the, the advances that we're making. You got the last word. Stay strong, stay safe. We will see you next week. The Communist Party's National Committee is meeting on Sunday. We're gonna build this party, y'all, because none of this stuff can be halted unless we have a stronger working class of democratic and socialist and left movement than the Communist Party is part of that. Don't you ever forget it, we are part of it. <laughs> And the bigger and the stronger and the better and the more militant and the more revolutionary we are, the more uh, progress is going to be made. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do it, and ain't nobody going to stop us. I thought I said Michael had the last word. I'm sorry, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Take care, stay strong, stay Later. safe, and stay in the fight. Bye, everybody.